Good afternoon. There comes a point in every conference where somebody stands up and takes a contrary view. We've just reached it. I don't recognise what I hear about the open trade that I've heard today. I do absolutely understand the problems that we all face, and I'll go into those. But I think that we are much further ahead in the game than you think we are. I need to address three, quickly, three points raised by the previous speaker. The idea of a register is already there. It's called VAT. I have to keep a registration of every object I buy, from whom I bought it, how I paid. And I can assure you that the tax people are much more onerous than the antiques department of the Met. Secondly, we have rigorous due diligence guidelines which absolutely uh, fit in with what he wanted there. In fact, it's a requirement of membership of our trade association that every object that is to be sold for more than 3,000 euros must be checked with the Interpol database and indeed other commercial databases. Export licenses. This sounds so good, doesn't it? You can't get anything into Germany unless it's got an export license. Well, this is all very well, but if I tell you that I purchased the Mustaki collection, which was exported from license, under license from Egypt in 1947, over a period of 15 years, and the export license, there were 10,000 objects, and the export license said 15 cases of antiques. It's not a very helpful document. We've talked a lot today about looted art. But it must be clear to all of us that the greatest crisis currently facing the world heritage is the destruction taking place in Syria and Iraq. The major causes of the destruction are twofold. War with indiscriminate shelling and bombing and deliberate destruction of monuments by fanatics in the name of their religion. Looting comes a poor third. Recent lurid headlines have suggested that the funding of ISIS through the sale of illicitly excavated antiquities is the foremost problem and actively encouraged by the trade. This is completely untrue. Wild speculation that tens of millions, sometimes even billions of pounds worth of antiquities are entering the market from Syria is common. No one with any knowledge of the market would give a moment's credence to these ideas. Although we have no doubt and acknowledge that amidst the destruction there is a lot of clandestine excavation, looting, taking place, there's no evidence to date of any significant material surfacing on the market. In any event, the licit market is small and the vast majority of antiquities have relatively modest value. Best estimates, and I'm happy to produce figures to back this up for you, these are facts, this is not speculation. Best estimates show that the global annual turnover of the open market for classical and pre-classical antiquities is less than 200 million euros per annum. The proportion of that consisting of objects from Syria is a small fraction, probably less than 10%. The illicit market must necessarily be smaller than that, since pieces which are illicit sooner or later invariably turn up. And as an ex-soldier, I can attest that some sort of sums of money we're talking about don't buy many arms. So the idea that ISIS is being paid for with Roman tear bottles worth $200 each is complete trash. At this point, I need to emphasize the difference between the licit trade and illegal traffic. The licit antiquities trade has no interest in the illegal traffic in stolen antiquities. The preservation of our ancient heritage is as vital to, to us as it is to anyone else here. The fact that we come from a different perspective, a commercial perspective, does not mean that our reverence for world cultural heritage is any less real than yours. Indeed, at its best, the trade is a positive force, devoting large resources to conservation and research. The earliest roots of archaeology started with collectors. The first museum was founded by a collector. It's the jobs of museums to collect and conserve for the benefit of the public, and this is impossible without a trade. The trade has not always had a good record in the past in dealing with smuggled material, but things have changed dramatically in the last 10 to 15 years and continue to do so. Our trade associations have actively collaborated with government in this country to address these issues. I also acknowledge 
that much of this change has been driven by our critics. Yet they should also acknowledge that in recent years we've made huge strides. No other area of the art market now prizes provenance more than we do. And the proof of this lies in the high price at auction fetched by those objects with fine demonstrable ownership history. But we too rely on information and this is rarely forthcoming from source countries or indeed from our own authorities. Sometimes this is because of a misplaced sense of pride, sometimes uh, because of lassitude, sometimes it must be said because of corruption. Even close to home, we're deliberately denied access to information. Earlier on was mentioned the so-called Bikina Archive, uh, named after a man who hasn't even been convicted. And this archive is jealously guarded by an academic in Cambridge, and morsels of information drip-fed how on earth are we supposed to conduct our necessary due diligence in the face of this attitude? Okay, that's the past. Now let's talk about the future. The real question for all of us is how much can be salvaged from these wars and by what means? What is needed is not breast beating and demonization of the trade, but new and accurate data that provides better grounds for answering these questions. It is for governments and international organisations to source this information and to pass it on to those on the ground, including law enforcement, museums and we ourselves, the trade. But this information must be based on facts and not on speculation. Only then can we halt or reduce smuggling on the borders of these countries. And perhaps attention at this point should be targeted on the countries directly bordering the conflict zones. It is our belief that much of the material that is being looted in Syria today is not even leaving the country, or if it is, it must be going to countries that are very close in the Near East. So can the trade help in all this? We obviously can't help on border patrols. There's no doubt that amidst the destruction, illicit material is being squirreled away, as I say. This really worries us as this material will necessarily surface on the open market sooner or later. And this could be some years from now. The challenge, therefore, is to identify it and, where possible, to return it when it's safe to do so. We all agree on that. It is clear that the help of the trade is going to be vital in confronting this problem and it will require a long-term collaboration. Those critics of the trade who find themselves unable to work with us should perhaps ask themselves if this attitude is really in the greater interest. It should be clear to you all, following recent events, who your enemy really is. It isn't us. The key to the problem lies in information. The technology now exists to record objects cheaply, and we would suggest that UNESCO should provide the support to allow vulnerable museums, and in particular off-site storage facilities, to photograph all their holdings. Once an object is recorded, the chances of recovery improve to an enormous extent. The same applies to above-ground archaeological sites. This is, of course, no help in the case of clandestine excavation, but it's a start. The issue can also be tackled from another direction. My trade association is working on a project which is intended to record objects which are on the market in perpetuity. This is intended to build up a database of those objects which can be legally traded without question, while providing an opportunity for potential claimants to identify those which are stolen. This is a huge demonstration of good faith and it will also make life much more difficult for those who deal illegally. And make no mistake, we talk about new laws being needed, but this is illegal. To deal in stolen antiquities from Syria is already illegal. It's something for which you can be jailed. No sensible dealer wants to get involved in that. We're willing and ready to play our part, which we regard as a vital one. And I say to you that if you want to suppress the black market, you should support the white. And that would include allowing more freedom of movement for legally held objects. 
less border controls, less export requirements, or have export requirements, but actually give export licenses. For heaven's sake, why not? If somebody's owned a piece in Italy for 100 years, why shouldn't they be able to sell it on the world market? Why do they have to go through this farrago every time and, and everything is blocked? So support the white trade and you will attack the black. Finally, I have to say that the best way of curtailing all this mayhem would be by returning the region to peace. We all know that. And at least we dealers can't be blamed for the war. That is something that our governments have to think about. And by the way, I might mention that before the Iraq war, the second Iraq war, I wrote to Tony Blair, begging him to put a tank in front of the museum once they took Baghdad. I got no reply. Uh, of course, the British postal system is very unreliable. <laughs> the first thing I heard from the government was a letter from them, once the Baghdad Museum had been looted, asking me what my trade association was going to do to stop this stuff coming on the market. And I have to say that my, a my answer to that was pretty Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> when I think of Nimrud, I feel like weeping. I've never been there. And now I never will. I have saved 15 seconds of my allotted time for us to just think about Nimrud, RIP.